time that Parkinson died, really, and by the 1850s, it, it was a proper science, mm. really. Mm. It made a huge difference. Anybody? Somebody any want, questions? Do you want to? I could have running a bit late, Marge, my fault for going over time at the beginning, but I'm famous for that. But we have, we have, a, we have a space because Teddy Tans is not going to be able to come, so we can, yeah. we can. We've got <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much. We'll move on um, to Dr. Patrick Lewis and Mr. Parkinson. The you ready? Thank you very much indeed. That's fine. Um, so uh, we've already heard uh, a lot about uh, James Parkinson and uh, the uh, the times in which uh, which he lived, and it falls to me to talk a little bit about his uh, his work as a uh, as a political agitator, if you like, uh, which is very very different from uh, from his work in geology and his work uh, in medicine. And uh, Professor Swash very uh, very uh, very kindly highlighted exactly how turbulent the times were that James Parkinson lived through. He lived through the French Revolution. He lived through a time when uh, political pamphleters were agitating to try and change the way in which uh, politics ran and countries ran, including Thomas Paine and his uh, famous uh, essay on common sense, which was one of the key prompters of the American Revolution. And we'll be returning to Thomas Paine later on in, the, uh, in this talk. And of course, he lived, also lived through the American Revolution, where a, a, a series of uh, states came together to look towards self-determination and uh, the development of uh, representative uh, democracy, where people were trying to develop a, a better world and a more equal world. <laughs> Throughout his life, he was uh, governed by uh, King George III. And it's important to highlight, actually, uh, exactly how turbulent the times were in Britain, not just in uh, in revolutionary France and revolutionary America, but also in the Britain and the London in which he uh, grew up. And just a few years before his uh, birth in uh, in London, the Jacobite uh, the Jacobite rebellion had occurred, where Bonnie Prince Charlie was uh, was attempting to overthrow the established uh, royal order. And uh, again, just a few years before his birth. The Battle of Culloden had occurred, where there was civil, uh, uh, where, where there was military strife within the United, uh, the United Kingdom, and this really highlights the turbulence of his times. And this must have greatly influenced Parkinson as he grew up. So Parkinson was born in 1755, and this is uh, a, a reproduction of uh, Stowe's map of Shoreditch from 1755, the year of his birth showing Hoxton Square uh, here on the outskirts of the city of London. For those of you who uh, walked around uh, the, the Hoxton Square today, you'll uh, recognize that the, uh, the area has somewhat changed since <laughs> Parkinson's time. And London was a very interesting place to uh, live during the uh, 18th century. This is an illustration by William Hogarth entitled Gin Lane, which was uh, drawn uh, a few years before Parkinson's birth. And though it was uh, an era of, uh, of great, uh, great wealth, but also great poverty. And uh, much, of, uh, much of the political work that, uh, that James Parkinson engaged, on, engaged in was looking at that tension between inequality in society. It's also important to note that uh, parliamentary uh, democracy, as we recognize it today, really wasn't the case back in the 18th century. This is uh, an episode of uh, Blackadder III, set during the 18th century, where Blackadder attempts to uh, get his servant, Baldrick, elected as the MP for Dunny on the World, a fictional rotten borough, uh, against uh, William Pitt the Younger and William Pitt the Even Younger, shown here. Uh, and we'll return to William Pitt uh, later on in the talk as well. Uh, eventually, uh, Baldrick wins the election because there's uh, one man and one vote, and that man happens to be uh, happens to be Edmund Blackadder. But actually, this is, although it's a parody, it's not far removed from the actual situation in many of the uh, political uh, many of the constituencies in the uh, in England at the time. And William Pitt himself was elected uh, on the basis of a hundred votes up in uh, Westmoreland, uh, and so actually it was possible to buy elections. And very very few people actually had the vote. This is uh, captured perhaps a, a, little, uh, a little more graciously by William Hogarth in a series of, uh, of paintings that he uh, produced uh, on elections, which highlighted the chaos that sometimes accompanied uh, elections at the time. And because of this, and because of uh, the writings of people like Thomas Paine, uh, the events in revolutionary France, there was a great deal of uh, agitation within England and within London to try and uh, get democracy more representative uh, within, uh, within the United Kingdom. 
Um, and with this came the establishment of a number of societies, including the London Corresponding Society, who were campaigning for a better representation and radical reform rep and better representation of the people within Parliament. Um, this was one of a number of different societies operating in the, uh, in the mid to late uh, 19, uh, 18th century in, uh, in London. And it's here that James Parkinson comes in. James Parkinson was a member of the London Corresponding Society and wrote a number of pamphlets uh, around uh, social issues and political issues uh, that, uh, that were associated with the London Corresponding Society. And it's important to note that uh, the pamphlets and, uh, and publications that came out at the time uh, really were a forum for debate about how countries should be governed. This is uh, Edmund Burke, who uh, wrote his Reflections on the Revolution in France uh, a few years after the uh, French Revolution. And Burke is recognized as being one of the, uh, the founders of what we recognize as conservatism today. And he was arguing against the, uh, the political changes that had been initiated in France uh, 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 with the overthrow, overthrow of the ancient regime. And of course, this was argued against very passionately and very strongly by a number of writers, both here in England, but also over in, uh, uh, in uh, revolutionary America. And Thomas Paine wrote uh, his uh, famous essay, The Rights of Man, actually an answer to, uh, to Edmund, Burke, Ed Edmund Burke's attack on the French Revolution. And this really is where James Parkinson comes in. He was uh, writing at the time uh, as uh, following his uh, involvement with the London Corresponding Society and wrote under the uh, pseudonym Old Her Hubert, uh, a, a guise perhaps to protect himself maybe from libel but also uh, from prosecution, as we'll learn uh, over, the, uh, over the next, uh, next few slides. And he wrote a number of seditious uh, pamphlets talking to many of the issues around representation in democracy and the uh, inequalities that were uh, present in society. One of the interesting things to reflect on uh, when you think about pamphleting during the 18th century and indeed during the uh, 17th century as well, that this really represented the cutting edge of communication. These small pamphlets uh, published uh, at, uh, in bulk and sold for very, very small amounts really equated to the Twitter of the day. And you can imagine that uh, the handing out of pamphlets at uh, very cheap cost was a way of spreading information and news uh, to a wider audience, which really hadn't been possible even uh, a couple of hundred years before. So he talked uh, as, uh, in his guise of uh, Old Hubert about a number of social issues, talking about the, uh, the, the wants of the poor and the downtrodden. But he seems to have had a particular bee in his bonnet about Edmund Burke. And similar to, uh, uh, similar to uh, Thomas Paine and also to Mary Wollstonecroft, uh, who was writing around the same time, he re uh, rejected the, uh, the, the theses put for, for, for forward by Edmund Burke, uh, denouncing the, uh, the French Revolution and uh, all that that stood for, and wrote a series of pamphlets uh, from the swinish multitude, the, uh, the downtrodden and the uh, poor in society, rebutting many of the arguments that, uh, that uh, Edmund Burke had put forward. And this really was a theme for a number of the uh, pamphlets that he wrote uh, around the, uh, the revolutionary uh, era. And of course, it's uh, one of the great things about uh, the, uh, the internet and the access to uh, uh, documents from former ages is actually you can download and access many of these pamphlets uh, online now. <laughs> many of them have been uh, scanned in and uh, published and are freely available. So if you're interested in learning more about this, I'd thoroughly recommend uh, uh, downloading and uh, reading a few of them. It's interesting to note that the uh, London Corresponding Society and Parkinson himself uh, occupied a space in society uh, between the sort of uh, uh, the absolutely radical uh, overthrow of uh, current society and uh, uh, people who were trying to reform the current institutions. Uh, and so the idea that, uh, that revolutions could occur without bloodshed, without the terror which had occurred after the French Revolution, without the civil war that had uh, occurred with the American Revolution, was a theme that occurred in many of the pamphlets uh, published around the time by the London Corresponding Society and by Parkinson himself. And so, in many ways, it's ironic that one of the political events that James Parkinson became embroiled in and uh, was, uh, was linked to was actually a, uh, very much a revolutionary uh, plot. And this is the popgun plot, which was, uh, which was uh, alleged to have occurred in the uh, very, very late 18th century, uh, 18th century in uh, around 1794 and 19, uh, 1795. 
This is a cartoon from uh, 1795 when King George uh, III's carriage was actually attacked by a crowd outside Parliament and the windows were smashed by people throwing stones uh, rather than uh, shooting at it as is uh, shown here. And the popgun plot was a, a plot that had been uncovered by, uh, by uh, the uh, agents of the, uh, of the state, suggesting that, uh, that King George III was the subject of an assassination plot, where a, a popgun, an air, air rifle, would be used to fire a poisoned dart at uh, King George, uh, killing him and uh, removing him from the, as head of state. A number of people were arrested and were tried for, uh, tried for treason. And this is where James Parkinson comes in. And actually, uh, very much his, uh, uh, his revealing as uh, the author of many of these uh, pamphlets, as old uh, Hubert, uh, came to light. He testified uh, before, uh, before the uh, Privy Council and in front of William Pitt, who we came across uh, earlier, in the, uh, earlier in my talk. Uh, testifying uh, in defense of the London Corresponding Society, whose members had been arrested. John Smith and George Higgins were members of the London Corresponding uh, Society. And so he was hauled up in front of uh, what was really one of the, uh, what, really the, uh, the, the top uh, examining, examining body in the uh, country, uh, and was uh, questioned by, uh, by the Privy Council and by Pitt. But unfortunately, as, uh, as was uh, the case for many of the uh, events around those times, it turned out that the case was, uh, was uh, really not based on any hard facts. And the key witness in the, uh, in the case, uh, a gentleman called Thomas Upton, uh, disappeared, some thought died, some thought, uh, thought fled. And he was the key witness of the state against the members of the London Corresponding Society. And it was he that James Parkinson was uh, partially, uh, partially rebutting. And there's evidence, uh, although it's by by no means certain. It's, very, of course, very difficult to ascertain these things now. That uh, James Park, that uh, Thomas Upton was actually a, a, a spy, uh, an agent provocateur, placed there by the state to try and uh, incriminate members of the London Corresponding Society. Needless to say, the uh, case uh, collapsed, but it does actually highlight the risks that many of these individuals ran, writing pamphlets and being involved in societies like the London Corresponding Society. Had they been found guilty of high, tre tre high treason, then the punishment uh, could, well have been, uh, could well have been death. After the, uh, the popcorn plot and, the, uh, uh, and coming up towards the uh, turn of the century, James Parkinson moved away from political writings and uh, pamphlets and turned his attention to the uh, exploits of which we uh, now recognize him for, including geology and his contributions to geology, and of course to uh, medicine with the description of, uh, of uh, the disease now named after him. And it's interesting to note that many of the, uh, the issues around which Parkinson was, uh, was campaigning and the members of the London Corresponding Society and Thomas Paine uh, were raising in terms of representation of the uh, people in Parliament, the way in which our society is governed, actually didn't occur until many, many years after his death. The Great Reform Act came in uh, almost 10 years after his death, and uh, general suffrage didn't occur until uh, after, the, uh, after the start of the 20th century. It would be interesting to uh, wonder now, as uh, we stand in uh, turbulent times once more, what he would view of Brexit, what he would view of the fact that we still have uh, hereditary peers sitting in the Lords. And I suspect, uh, certainly on the latter, he wouldn't be tremendously pleased. Um, and with that, uh, I will finish. Thank you very much.